Has anybody here ever experienced the feeling of being disappointed? Anybody? Yeah, we've all experienced this feeling, right? All of us throughout our lives in a million different ways experience that feeling of disappointment. Sometimes it's in small things, like when we go to Tim Hortons and they don't have our favorite donut, right? I know for some people that's maybe more of a big disappointment than a small disappointment. But then there's other things, right, where maybe we're really hoping for a certain job and we don't get the job. Or maybe we put an offer for the house and we don't get the house. We all experience these times where we go through disappointment. If you've never experienced disappointment, if you can't really resonate with what I'm saying, then you're probably setting the bar way too low, okay, in your life. I just want to raise that bar up a little bit. So I want you to think for a minute right now about one of the greatest disappointments you've ever experienced in your life. Okay, just take a second and think about it. What was the greatest disappointment that you've ever experienced? I'm going to be vulnerable with you right now, okay? I'm going to tell you one of the greatest disappointments that I've ever experienced. One of the greatest disappointments that I've ever experienced in my life was coming to the realization that I was not a superhero. (laughs) That I did not have superpowers. Can anyone relate? (laughs) This is a safe place. It's okay. You can put up your hand. Okay, so I've never really been into superhero movies, But when I was a kid, my favorite movie was a movie called Matilda. Is anybody familiar with Matilda? It was a great movie. So Matilda was a child genius, and as she was growing up, she came to the realization that she had telekinetic powers. Okay, she could move things with her mind. She was kind of like the 90s kids version of Eleven from uh, Stranger Things. So for those of you who that makes more sense. But she, was, she didn't get nosebleeds and there wasn't all the scary stuff. All right? But I thought that this was just awesome. I was amazed by this. Okay? And I thought that if I just practiced, I could probably develop this telekinetic power too. I also could pour my milk onto my cereal without ever having to touch the carton. Awesome, right? And so I would practice. Not with milk, that was too risky, but I would set up the salt and pepper shakers on the table and I would stare at them and with like everything I had within me, I would focus. I would focus so, so hard, so very hard on trying to move those salt and pepper shakers. And sometimes I genuinely believed that they moved just a little bit, just a little bit, just a millimeter, okay? I really believed this. But eventually, like last week or so, (laughs) I had to accept the fact that unlike Matilda, I do not have superpowers. Okay, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to suggest that most of you here probably fantasize at some point in your life about having superpowers as well. And at some point, you had to come to the same realization that I did. It's quite a letdown. When we're kids, before we become old and jaded, right, we all dream about having extraordinary powers because we want to do extraordinary things. And it can be quite a disappointment to realize that we're actually just very ordinary. So this morning we're picking up where we left off last week in the book of Exodus. And we're in the middle of this passage where God calls Moses to do something that's a superhero kind of job. God calls Moses to go to Pharaoh and to lead the, the, sorry, the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery. But the problem is that Moses isn't really a superhero kind of guy. Moses is just an ordinary kind of guy. And so he really struggles to accept that God's calling him and not someone else with better qualifications to do this job. So let's just recap quickly on the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus begins with God's chosen people, the Israelites, being taken into slavery by the Egyptians. So there's a new pharaoh in power in Egypt, and this pharaoh's getting worried because the Israelites are reproducing way too quick. 
They just keep having babies, babies and babies, and there's way too many of them. Okay, so they're gaining too much power, and the Pharaoh decides that he needs to do something about this to contain these people. And so what he decides is that he's going to put the Israelites into slavery, and that he's going to send out an order that all Hebrew baby boys are to be killed okay, after they're born. And this is the context into which Moses was born as a Hebrew baby boy. But Moses wasn't killed. Okay, after he's born, his mom puts him into a basket, and she leaves him in the Nile River. And eventually he gets found by Pharaoh's own daughter. And he's rescued, and he actually, ironically, ends up being raised in Pharaoh's own household. It's just wild. And so when Moses grows up, he goes to visit his people. And he sees how they're being treated in slavery. And Moses has a soft spot for his people. He's just enraged by this, right? And what does he do? He decides he's got to take things into his hands. He has to do something about this injustice, and he kills an Egyptian slave master. But murder doesn't always go well for you, okay? Murder is not generally a good solution to any problem, and so they all, everyone in Egypt ends up wanting to kill Moses, including the Pharaoh. And so he has to run away. And he runs away to a place called Midian. And in Midian, Moses starts a new life, okay? a normal life. He has a wife. He has two sons. He works a normal job as a shepherd. For 40 years, Moses works on establish, establishing this normal life, and he does everything that he can to try to forget about what happened in Egypt. Until, one day, God intervenes. Moses is out in the wilderness, way out in the wilderness, with his flock, and he sees this bush. And this bush is on fire, but it's not burning up. And so he goes to check it out, and God starts to talk to him through this book. No, not a book. Through a bush. Sorry. And he commands Moses to go to Pharaoh and to lead the Israelites out of slavery. But Moses is convinced that he's not the right guy for the job. And so this morning we're picking up where we left off in the middle of this dialogue between God and Moses. If you have your Bible, you can open it up with me to Exodus 4. We're going to work our way through verses uh, 1 to 17. And so we're kind of jumping in on the middle of this interaction between God and Moses. And God has just explained to Moses exactly how everything is going to happen. All right, he's going to go to the elders of Israel, and they're going to believe him. And then together, they're going to go to the Pharaoh, and they're going to tell Pharaoh to set the Israelites free from slavery. But Pharaoh isn't going to listen. And then God's going to do a bunch of miracles. And then eventually, Pharaoh will give in and let them go. So God has just told Moses all of this. And this is where we're picking up in the text. So we're going to break it up a little bit. We're going to start by looking at verses 1 to 9. So Exodus 4, 1 to 9. But Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say, the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked, what's that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff, and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told him. Then they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, really has appeared to you. Then the Lord said to Moses, now put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out again, his hand was white as snow with a severe skin disease. Now put your hand back in your cloak, the Lord said. So Moses put his hand back in, and when he took it out again, it was as healthy as the rest of his body. The Lord said to Moses, if they do not believe you and are not convinced by the first miraculous sign, they'll be convinced by the second sign. And if they don't believe you, 
or listen to you even after these two signs, then take some water from the Nile River and pour it on the dry ground. When you do, the water from the Nile will turn to blood on the ground. So God has given Moses the rundown. He's told him exactly what's going to happen. But Moses still has some concerns. He says, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? All right, so this is actually the third question, the third objection that Moses brings to God. We heard the first two last week. The first objection that Moses brought to God was this question of, who am I? Right? Who am I to go and stand before Pharaoh? It was about his identity. And then the second question that Moses brought to God was about God's identity. He asked God, who are you? Who should I tell them sent me? And now he comes to God with this doubt. He says, what if they won't believe me? Now, God doesn't respond by giving Moses words of reassurance. He doesn't say, no, Moses, don't worry. I told you, they'll believe you. Well, he does something way cooler. He asks Moses a question. He says, Moses, what's in your hand? Now, God knew what was in Moses' hand, didn't he? God knows everything, right? He wasn't asking this question because he needed the information. But this is one of those moments where God asks Moses a question because he wants him to really think about what it is that's in his hand, and everything that it represents. God wants Moses to pay attention. And what Moses had in his hand was a shepherd's staff. But in reality, that staff represented so much more. It was a symbol of this entire life that Moses has established for himself in Midian. This was the tool that Moses used day in and day out to do this work that had come to define him. This was the staff that gave him security. It gave him comfort. It gave him control. It gave him control over all of those little sheep, and it gave him control over his life. So God says, throw it down. Throw it down. And what happens when Moses throws that that piece of wood on the ground. It turns into a snake. That's nuts. And so Moses does what any reasonable person would do in this situation. He runs, right? He bolts. And then in verse 4, God tells Moses to pick up the snake by the tail. Okay, now, I am no expert, but here's a hot tip. If you ever come face to face with a poisonous snake while you're out in the wilderness, do not pick the snake up by its tail because the snake will curve up its squirmy little snake body and it will bite you. But Moses has enough faith in God in this moment, so he picks up the snake and the snake turns back into his staff in his hand. And then God tells Moses to put his hand inside of his cloak. At this point, I would have been freaking right out if I was Moses, right? Like, what is going to happen to my hand? But Moses does it, and when he does, his hand uh, turns white and diseased, right? Some of your translations might say that it was leprous. Really, the, the Hebrew text just means it was a serious skin condition. And then God tells Moses to put his hand back into his cloak, and he pulls it out, and it looks brand new. So God says to Moses, all right, if the first sign doesn't do it, then do the second sign. And if the second sign doesn't do it, then what I want you to do is I want you to pick up some water from the Nile, scoop up some water, and then pour it on the ground. And the water is going to turn into blood. It's kind of gross, really, isn't it? But each of these signs that God gives to Moses is a symbol. Okay, it's a symbol of Egypt's lack of power before God. In this culture, both the staff and the uh, the serpent were symbols of authority. Some of you might be able to picture that the pharaoh wore uh, a picture of a cobra, right, on his headpiece. So they were symbols of authority. And they, they showed pharaoh, the, the idea was to show pharaoh that God had power over him and ultimately over Egypt. And in this culture, 
it was believed there was this, this understanding that skin disease was inflicted on people when they had an attitude that was arrogant towards God. And so this second sign showed that God was able to punish Pharaoh for his arrogance towards him. And in Egypt, the Nile River was the source of all of their prosperity. This was an incredibly important body of water. And so the third sign shows that God ultimately has power over the livelihood of the Egyptians. So these weren't just random acts, right? These were clear demonstrations to Pharaoh of the power that God had over him and over Egypt. Let's continue reading. We're at verse 10. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, O Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now, even though you have spoken to me. I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. Then the Lord asked Moses, Who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. So here we see that Moses is really worried about his own inadequacy. He essentially says, God, I get that you can do some really cool stuff. I see that you've got some pretty amazing signs lined up so that people will believe that you sent me. But here's the real problem. I don't speak good. Okay? I didn't speak well before you came to me, and I still don't speak now after you've spoken to me. And so then God comes to Moses with another question. He says, Moses, remind me again, who was it that made your mouth? It's a good question. So God gives Moses this reassurance. He says he's going to be with them. It's going to be him speaking through Moses, and they can get through it together. So let's keep going. We're on verse 13. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. And the Lord became angry with Moses. All right, he said. What about your your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he speaks well, and look, he's on his way to meet you now. He'll be delighted to see you. Talk to him and put the words in his mouth. I will be with both of you as you speak, and I will instruct you both in what to do. Aaron will be your spokesman to the people. He'll be your mouthpiece, and you will stand in the place of God, telling him what to say. And take your shepherd's staff with you and use it to perform the miraculous signs that I have shown to you. So Moses pleads with God for one final time. All right, he's all out of excuses. He doesn't have any more questions. God's answered all, answered all of the questions that he had. He just says, Lord, please send anyone else. And at this point, God gets angry. But even in his anger, he doesn't give up on his plan to use Moses. Actually, he makes a concession. He says, all right, Moses, I'll let you have your brother Aaron come alongside you, and he's going to act as your mouthpiece, right? And so God is going to speak to Moses, and Moses is going to speak to Aaron, and Aaron is going to speak to the people on behalf of God. And then in verse 17, God reminds Moses to take along his staff, which he's going to use to do these miracles, and he essentially sends him off. And at this point, Moses comes to accept that he's not going to be getting out of this. All right, if we look ahead to the next verse, we see that he actually goes to his father-in-law, Jethro, to get his blessing to go back to Egypt. And so he goes ahead with God's plan, reluctantly. To say that Moses struggled to accept his calling in all of this is a massive understatement. And so it's easy for us to look at this story and to kind of say, what's wrong with this guy? Right? Why is he so stubborn? Why is he so resistant? Why doesn't he just follow what God's telling him to do? But when we come to this part in the text, we need to remember that Moses is a man with a past. We've all been in situations where we felt like we were doing the right thing, and it didn't go well. Maybe we were misunderstood, misunderstood, 
Maybe we didn't get the outcome that we were looking for. Moses had already tried to do something about the injustice that was taking place in Egypt towards his people. And it didn't go well. And he'd done everything he could possibly do to forget about all of that. Right? And now God is telling him that he's got to go back. Moses must have been having like a very visceral reaction, like a strong reaction of fear. Right? If you have to flee from somewhere because everybody wants to kill you, you're not going to be looking up for vacation packages on Expedia to go back. Right? He doesn't want to go back to Egypt ever again. He doesn't even want to think about it. But beyond that, Moses feels entirely inadequate to do what God is calling him to do. He has a messy past. He doesn't communicate well. He's living a very normal life at this point. He's no Clark Kent. He doesn't even have telekinetic powers like Matilda. He's just a normal shepherd. He spends his time taking care of sheep. That's what he does. That's what he's good at. That's what he's comfortable doing. And we all love being comfortable, don't we? So God is calling Moses to do something that's bigger and scarier than he ever could have imagined. And it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be comfortable, and God doesn't even promise Moses that he's going to be safe. And so Moses questions God, and he comes up with excuses, and he pleads with God to choose anybody else. And I think that we can kind of relate to how he responds in this. How do you respond when you feel like God is calling you to do something that requires you to step out of your comfort zone? It could be something... Minor, like just sending someone a text message, or it could be something big, like packing up your bags and moving to the other side of the world. How do you respond when you feel like God is calling you to do something that requires you to step out of your comfort zone? So often, I really think we want to be obedient to God. We want to follow Jesus, but fear gets in our way. Most of us here, if we're following Jesus, have had these experiences where we feel like God's calling us to do something, but we don't do it because we're afraid. Sometimes we doubt whether we're hearing God correctly, and so we kind of go back and forth in our minds, and then time passes, and then the opportunity is gone. Sometimes some of us might worry about what other people think. If we're following Jesus, sometimes we're going to do things that doesn't make sense to other people. If we're following Jesus, we're not always going to fit in. And for some of us, that fear of what other people think can just be crushing. It paralyzes us. Maybe some of us feel entirely inadequate for what God is calling us to do. Maybe some of us are just really attached to that feeling of comfort. Right? We all like to be comfortable, and maybe we just can't get the courage to step outside of that. But whatever the struggle may be, fear so often gets in our way. And so we stay where we are, and we miss out on being a part of what God is calling us to do. So often, when we feel like God is calling us to do something, we respond in a way that is very similar to Moses in, the, in this passage here. And one of the most encouraging things about this passage is that God actually sticks it out with Moses and he works through all of his fears with him. Right? God could have just said, all right, Moses, if you want to stay comfortable, if you want to stay where you are, if you're not willing to pull up your socks, then that's fine. I'll choose someone else, right? You wimp. And he could have moved along. But he doesn't do that. He walks with Moses through every fear. He's incredibly patient with Moses. And even when he eventually has had enough and he gets angry, he makes this concession. He compromises. He lets, Aaron, sorry, he lets Moses take along Aaron to compensate for his biggest area of insecurity and weakness. When God calls Moses, 
The only thing that Moses has is a stick in his hand. The only thing he's got is a stick in his hand. Right? At this point, we don't even know where all the sheep are. Right? He's got a stick. It's that stick that he used day in and day out to keep the sheep from getting away from the flock. It's the stick that represented this comfortable life, this life that he'd made for himself in Midian. He didn't have an impressive resume. He didn't have the skill set or the qualifications to do the job. The only thing that Moses had was a stick in his hand. But that stick was all that God needed. If we look ahead in verse 20, Moses' staff is actually called the staff of God. When Moses was willing to lay that staff down, God was able to do miracles with it. And as he carries that stick into Egypt, God uses that stick to change the course of history. God took an ordinary stick and he used it for his extraordinary purposes. And these stories that we're working through in Exodus are really just rumblings. Okay, they're rumblings of God's early work of salvation. And ultimately, they point ahead to God's ultimate work of salvation in Jesus Christ. And if we look ahead to the New Testament, we see the same thing of God taking ordinary people in ordinary situations and empowering them to do extraordinary things. Right? When Jesus began his ministry, he called a bunch of guys who were working an ordinary job as fishermen. And they laid down their nets, and they followed him. And Jesus told the disciples that he was going to make them fishers of men. Right? It's kind of, it sounds kind of weird. It's like, do you mean mermaids or what? Really, what he's saying is he's going to use the disciples to lead people into the kingdom of God. And in the book of Acts, we see this happening in incredible ways. We see these guys come to life and perform miracles and preach the gospel like they never would have thought was possible. In the gospels, we read about a little boy who had a couple of ordinary things in his hands. He had some bread and he had a couple of fish. Right? And he saw a very hungry crowd sitting there listening to Jesus he didn't have a lot, but what he had, he just gave over to Jesus. And Jesus used it to feed over 5,000 people who were listening to him teach. In Acts, we hear about Paul's conversion. Paul was a guy who was just crushing it in the religious world at the time. He was a descendant of Abraham. He was obedient to the law, like in the strictest sense possible. Acts actually tells us that he was passionate about, follow, or about killing followers of Jesus. He was passionate about killing Christians. But then what happens? God takes the least likely candidate and he knocks him off of his feet. Quite literally, actually. And he calls Paul to be an apostle to the Gentiles. So Paul lays down his status he lays down his reputation. He lays down everything that at one point he would have considered to be a major accomplish, accomplishment. And God uses him to plant churches and to point people towards Jesus and ultimately to write a big portion of what's now our New Testament. It's amazing. God does amazing things with ordinary people. In John 14, 12, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I'm going to be with the Father. Jesus is talking about you. He's talking about me. He's talking about us. It's amazing. When Jesus walked this earth, he did all kinds of incredible works, from acts of servanthood to miracles that nobody could understand. And what Jesus is saying here is that the Holy Spirit is going to empower us to do these same kinds of incredible works in his name. And he says that we're going to do even greater works. Right? Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. It doesn't get much greater than that. But what makes it so amazing is that you and I are just ordinary people continuing 
this miraculous, extraordinary work in his name, just living ordinary lives and letting God work through us. God doesn't need us to be superheroes to use us to do extraordinary things. He just needs us to trust him. He just needs us to lay down what we've got, to give it over to him, and to step out in faith. He just needs us to listen for his voice and to respond to his call. And he doesn't promise us that it's going to be comfortable. And he doesn't even promise us that we're going to be safe. But he promises us something so much better than that. He makes the same promise to us that he made to Moses. That he's going to be with us. Matthew 28 verse 20 says this. Be sure of this. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He's with us. And so we can step out in faith regardless of the risk that it might bring into our lives. So the question I have for each one of us this morning is this. What do you have in your hand? What do you have in your hand? What are you good at? What gifts has he given you? Where do you spend your time? Who has God made you to be? What normal, ordinary things can you lay before God so that he can use them for his extraordinary purposes? If you're good at fixing things, how could you lay that down and let God use it for extraordinary purposes? If you're good at fixing things, also let me know because I'm really good at breaking things and not good at fixing them. If you're a teacher, how could you lay that down to God and let him use you for his extraordinary work? What if you made a commitment to nurture the best qualities in the, in the students that everyone else just kind of writes off? What if you made a commitment to pray for every kid who walks through your door? You might be the only person praying for them. How could you lay it down? If you're in a management position, how could you lead differently in your workplace? How could you have the heart of a servant to surprise people with with what it means to follow Jesus? How could you use your leadership abilities for the kingdom of God? How could you lay that down? If you're retired, you're not off the hook. There isn't any retirement in the kingdom of God. Okay, the Bible, the New, I'm sorry to tell you, the New Testament does not lay out a retirement plan. We're all called to serve. So if you're tired, what are you passionate about? What are you good at? Where could you be serving others and showing other people God's love? What could you lay down to give to God for his purposes? It doesn't matter who you are or what you've got or what you do with your time, regardless of how ordinary it might seem. When we offer it to God, he can take it and he can transform it and he can use it to do extraordinary things. And it's important that we remember we're not doing a bunch of stuff for God to try to make him happy with us, right? God is already happy with us. It's good news. He's already happy with us. We're doing things with God to point people towards his kingdom because it's where we find real life. So we're going to close by reading a prayer called the the Peace Prayer uh, by St. Francis of Assisi. And my challenge for us this week is to each pray this prayer every day. Okay, there's some copies of it out at the info hub, or you could look it up online. But to pray this prayer every day, and not to just pull it out and to rush through it as we're like brushing our teeth and putting on our socks and doing all the other things, okay, but to actually step aside from the busyness, to step away from our phones or whatever it is that distracts us, and to mean the words as we pray them. And then, to focus on one part of the prayer and to ask God how we can actually live that out in practice. Okay, so for example, the prayer at one point says, where there's hatred, let me sow love. So where's their hatred in my life? Where's their hatred in the lives of the people around me? How can I sow love into that situation? Okay, God might not show up to us in a burning bush like he showed up to Moses but he does want to speak to us. And if we 
invite him to, and if we open ourselves up to it, he will speak to us. And so let's ask him to speak to us as we pray this together now. I'll read it aloud, and as I do, um, you can just ask God how he wants you to live this out. Okay? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. Where there's sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it's in giving that we receive, it's in pardoning that we're pardoned, and it's in dying that we're born to eternal life.